Warm greetings from CNS. Welcome everyone to this very special webinar on conference in the Global Tobacco Treaty, which is formally called WHO Framework Convention on Since almost 16 to 17 years, CNS team members have been part of network of tobacco transnationals or NAT hosted by Corporate Accountant, which was earlier called INFACT. NAT has worked dedicatedly to protect the global community and its implementation from tobacco industry interference. The World Health Organization recognizes how tobacco industry interference, interference thwarts public health. Our governments have sustainable development goals at last year's UN General Assembly, one of which is to effectively the FCTC. We will fail to meet the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs if we let the industry delay, dilute, defeat or derail the progress. Today's panel of experts will share more on this. But before that, let me make all participants are requested to please send us your questions while panelists present. Just type your questions in using chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen. We'll take up these questions during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present so that we have good enough time left for questions and answers. Thanks for your cooperation. Without any, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsuru. Ashok Ramsuru, as a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with of rich experience in journalism. Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter, Ila Gandhi, and CN this year's Health Justice Lifetime Achievement of Award on Ashok Ramsuru in the urban south. Congratulations, Ashok, and over to you now. Thank you kindly for that warm uh, welcome. Well, I'll bring you warm greetings from Durban, South Africa. Tobacco industry interference in public health is also here in South Africa and, and in the rest of Africa. Let me share an example to give you a sense of how dangerous it is to public health, a transnational tobacco company has sued the Minister of Health of South Africa in recent years claiming that the Tobacco Products Control Act was unconstitutional. But the court found that the hazards of tobacco smoking far outweigh what industry was claiming. And the court noted that South Africa is a, is a party to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and is obliged to have regard for the requirements of that treaty. Having a strong global tobacco treaty is so important to keep industry out in countries too from health policy making. Now, let me introduce the panel of experts. Stella Villos, Associate Professor at University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing and advisor to the World Health Organization. Samuel Ochiang, Chief Executive Officer of Consumer Information Network Kenya and part of leadership of Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals, NET. Chloe Frankel, Senior International Organizer, Challenge Big Tobacco Corporate Accountability International and also leads NET. But before we go to our first panelist, let us listen to a special guest today on the webinar noted journalist Maitri Porecha. Maitri is now over to you and let's hear your views. Maitri, are you there? Maitri, can't hear you. Good 
Zero to Matri. Maitri, can you hear us? We cannot hear you, Maitri. I can't hear you, Maitri. Okay, I think we can begin with Stella. I think as Metri must be having some uh, IT issues at her end. Uh, Great. Okay, let, so let me introduce. I, let, let me rather let me rather introduce our next panelist, Stella Billis, associate professor at University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing and advisor to the World Health Organization. Is now over to Stella. It's over to you, Stella. Yes, hi. Can everybody hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, very important webinar, particularly as we are all getting ready for the Conference of the Parties, the seventh conference that, of the parties that will be hosted by India. I am just going to very briefly give a little background on uh, what, what is tobacco industry interference and why are we talking about it? Because Many times, um, I'm trying to show my screen here. I hope it, it's showing. Yes. And uh, yes. Good, good. I'm trying to. Thank you. Because we talked about tobacco industry interference a lot, uh, particularly those of us who are involved in tobacco control. And it might not be clear to everybody what exactly do we mean by tobacco industry interference? Why do we need to address it? Why is it different than any other business that tries to promote their own interests? And what can we do to actually address it once that we identify that is something we do need to do? So just as a reminder that the WHO during World No Tobacco Day 2012 actually did a really great job in trying to group the different types of interference from the tobacco in industry in, in six main categories. Um, one is maneuvering to hijack the political and legislative process, and that's something we see mostly through lobbying, campaign contributions, financial contributions to different political um, endeavors or initiatives. The industry also tends to exaggerate its economic importance. Every time we hear about the in any country about the importance of the industry, tobacco industry contribution to the economy is never tempered with the costs, the environmental costs and of course the human suffering a disease and death that it costs, not just cost to individuals and families and communities, but also to countries and national health systems. Um, they also manipulate the public opinion in an effort to gain an appearance of respectability. Tobacco companies in general are not very trusted because now we know that for decades they knew about the harms of tobacco and hid that. And so one of the ways to do, they do that is through very widespread corporate social responsibility programs where they do quote unquote charity in order to become essential members of the communities and to become really woven within the fabricas of our societies, which is again to, to make, um, create sort of a dependence on their economic uh, largesse, not to accounting that for each little bit that they may contribute in a corporate social responsibility program, they actually gained a lot either by delaying legislation and of course costs of people that continue to suffer and be addicted to tobacco products. Uh, they fabricate support through front groups, and I'm going to discuss that one in more details in just a minute. They continue to discredit proven science, 
For decades, the industry, for example, denied that secondhand tobacco smoke was harmful to health, and, and they created a whole array of programs where they would fund scientists, their own and others, to create um, science to counter that or to divert attention to other issues. And of course, the last one, or not the last but not least, which is one that we see very frequently now, is intimidating governments with litigation or threats of litigation. And just in our introduction, we already heard about that, uh, both in domestic court and now increasingly threat of litigation in international courts. But I want to go back to a little bit about this fabricating support through front groups. And a lot of it is front groups, but some of it is allies. Um, and these are groups that the industry either create it themselves or that they fund to represent its interests. And so it gives a voice to tobacco industry without being recognized as the industry. It creates some controversy or sometimes none exists. For, for example, it still creates controversy about the issues of taxation and that taxation leads to crime, where in fact we know that taxation leads to decrease in consumption. And, and it creates an appear that the industry is not alone, that they have all these other stakeholders from different uh, sectors in society that support them. And that's very important because as we are going into the COP, we are seeing a very, very significant uh, level of activity from some of these groups. For example, the International Tobacco Growers Association and similar national associations was entirely really created by the tobacco industry not to protect the growers who are usually the weakest link in the whole tobacco production chain but to protect its own interest pretending to be the growers. Uh, we see groups that pretend to represent and I quote unquote course concerned citizens and taxpayers and, and so trying to speak in the voice of people who are taxpayers and taxpayers should be concerned but not with tobacco control but with the tobacco companies and the cost uh, they impose in society. And they also fund or partner with conservative think tanks and economics research institutes, ITIC being one and a very current example is the Reason Foundation which is published um, and got a lot of publicity for a report on claiming uh, lack of transparency in COP procedures. So the Article 5.3 of the Framework Convention recognized the harms of the industry to advancing tobacco control and this is what they actually actually says. In setting and implementing the public health policies with respect to tobacco control, parties shall act to protect these policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry in accordance with national law. I want to highlight that in accordance with national law is a fairly standard treaty and it doesn't mean that your country needs to have a comprehensive tobacco control law before they can implement Article 5.3. And in fact, that's another set of misinformation being propagated by the industry and its allies. That just means that, of course, you're not going to do something that is against the law and it's fairly standard treaty language. Other treaties have similar language. And then again, it doesn't mean that you can't act on 5.3 until there is some sort of national comprehensive legislation telling you to do so. Uh, the guidelines for Article 5.3 offer a lot of details on how parties can actually do this protection of policies from industry and influence. And very importantly, it recognizes a incompatibility between tobacco industry interests and public health interests, which means we can never ever be partners in tobacco control with the tobacco industry. We can never partner with the industry when we are developing, implementing or enforcing our tobacco control policies. And the recent impact assessment to the, the COP highlights the importance of implementing Article 5.3. This is the how. This is how we're going to stop it. And it talks about how the role and activities of the global tobacco industry remain by far the most important obstacle to action across all aspects of the FCTC. It interferes with 
implementing smoke-free laws and interferes with implementing comprehensive bans on advertising and sponsorship, interferes with raising taxes, etc. So a strong and coordinated and transparent application of Article 5.3 across all government, this is a whole of government effort, is a high priority for us for the progress and implementation. And I will stop here and I believe, are we taking questions now or later? We'll take the questions later, Stella. Okay, so I'll, I'll After wait. After all panelists have presented. Thank, thank you very much for your opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that was uh, our first panelist, Stella Villas, Associate Professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing and Advisor to the World Health Organization. Well, Stella set the st perfect stage for us, but now, earlier on, we had the gremlin setting in, in into our IT, and let me introduce our very first panel of experts, a noted um, journalist, Neti Oresha. Let's listen to her, and she's a very special guest today on the webinar. Can you hear me? We can see her screen now, Maitri. Go for it. Can you hear us? Can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Yes, Hello. we can hear you. Hey, yeah, you can hear. yeah, okay, all right. Um give me a yes. second, please. Are you being able yes. to hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay, um so I'm presenting on the industry interference in uh, uh in basically obstructing obstructing journalists from writing what they have to write against the uh, tobacco industry. Um, very recently I got uh, two emails uh, from the Reason Foundation. Uh, but before that I would like to present the second slide which says that there has been an influence of fossil fuel industry as well on climate talks. Now this is about drawing parallels. Uh, the World Cold Association... Can, I Can you hear me? Can Not I in clear. <laughs> no, please. Please make the slides full screen, Matri. Please make the slides. I'm not. I don't know. I'm not being able to maneuver this properly. Okay, fine. Then go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Yeah, but can it be? Can it be maneuvered by the organizer? You have. I think it's fine. You go ahead. Whatever you were showing, please show again. Yes. Okay. Um, now the team, slide right yeah, the oil companies, uh, yes. they aggressively keep lobbying, you know, in the European Union. Now, basically, uh, that is when they are the ones who are influencing the meetings in climate change. Uh, now, if we were to take a parallel of how uh, tobacco companies are, uh, uh, you know, basically the question being, are they, should they be allowed to be a part of the FTCC talks or not? And here there is a joint uh, consensus on the fact that they should not be allowed to be a part of these talks as they are influencers in a, in a negative way. Uh, I got an email on uh, September 16, 2016 and it was a very shocking email. Uh, now the Reason Foundation told me that uh, the WHO tobacco treaty is actually a threat to public health. Uh, they also said that the documents which were released by WHO uh, in advance of a November meeting which is to be held now, they, sh they allege that WHO has been operating in secret to limit access to new technologies. Now new technologies by that they mean e-cigarettes. Now they also claim that e-cigarettes have helped people to quit smoking. Now um, this is actually there has been no proof on the fact that 
e-cigarette has uh, helped people to quit smoke. On the other hand, everyone in unanimous consensus, WHO, the union, uh, there is the Indian government, the Indian national government, and uh, the Maharashtra state government have uh, contemplated and in their own capacities banned the usage of e-cigarettes. And therefore, the claim made by the Reason Foundation is, uh, therefore, looks very hollow. So that is the point that uh, I am wanting to make uh, in this meeting. Uh, now, I have covered the topic of e-cigarettes myself at uh, various levels. And I'll take a minute to make you understand uh, what kind of problems are caused by e-cigarettes. Uh, the Deputy Controller of Drug Abuse in the United States, Richard Crompton, he himself had admitted to the fact that uh, e-cigarettes uh, are harmful because little children, uh, if they have access to their parents or grandparents' e-cigarettes, they have sometimes unloaded the cartridge and have uh, consumed the nicotine, the liquid nicotine, and uh, therefore have all, the e-cigarettes have also caused deaths in certain uh, cases including the death of a two-year-old Israeli girl. Now, that has been well documented. Um, apart from that, uh, e-cigarettes, uh, which were, uh, you know, they were sort of uh, uh, hauled up by the Maharashtra Food and Drugs Administration inspectors. Uh, they had showed that the amount of nicotine in the e-cigarettes is 11 mg, and uh, the amount of nicotine which is permissible to wean off a person uh, from smoking in chewies, the nicotine chewies is 2 to 4 mg. So naturally, uh, the e-cigarette companies are not making it uh, public as to how much nicotine contents are uh, available in the uh, in the particular e-cigarettes. Uh, now, all of this, uh, uh, you know, sort of makes us extremely wary about the fact uh, that uh, e-cigarettes are being used. Another example was that e-cigarettes were being sold uh, in, uh, in, in the Indian airline carrier Air India and uh, certain people had uh, uh, sort of objected to this after which Air India had to withdraw the sale of e-cigarettes in their uh, airline. Uh, these were certain cases of activism which were undertaken by the media and the public health activists in Bombay and in India uh, in order to curb the and regulate the sale of e-cigarettes. Another point that I wanted to make was the former health minister in the, un the 45th Union meeting in Barcelona, Dr. Harshwardhan had said that India is contemplating a ban in e-cigarettes. However, uh, the former health minister uh, was removed from his particular position in uh, the last year, and some other health minister was appointed in his place. Um, now, this was being touted as a move uh, which was lobbied by the tobacco companies uh, which were influencing the allegedly influencing the decisions of the government of India. Uh, all of this goes to say that there is an increasing interference of tobacco lobby uh, as seen uh, in India and that is the case that I wanted to present which are influencing journalists and uh, the government to uh, their derailing efforts to bring about a stronger uh, negotiations in FTCC. Uh, that is all I had to say. Uh, I hope you've been able to hear me well, and uh, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Maitri Poreche, and very noted journalist for sharing this outrageous example almost in real time. So important when COP7 to FCTC is about to open next month. Well, there is no doubt we need to keep people before profits. Now let us hear from Samuel Ochiang, Chief Executive Officer of Consumer Information Network in Kenya, and who is also among the leadership of Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals, or NET. It's now over to you, uh, Samuel. Thank you very much. I will not uh, share a slide because uh, most of the slides I wanted to share already have been shared by the others. I want to take it up from uh, what Stella stated, and uh, I, I want to share two examples. One, the BAT bribery in Africa, with the focus on Kenya. And you will all remember that uh, uh, last year, on the 30th of November, there was that expose by the BBC Panorama program, uh, where it showed that uh, 
BAT had bribed a number of public officials in a number of countries in East and Central Africa, including Kenya, Uganda, Burundi, and other countries. This is a, uh, was, BAT was bribing them. It spent tens of thousands of dollars, and basically these were trips abroad, they were, you know, payments and, 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 and these were focusing mainly on politicians. The focus, of course, was to uh, ensure that uh, BAT has a bigger market to intimidate its competitors in the market and to ensure that there was no legislation and also to influence uh, those uh, positions of those countries uh, in international decision making. This uh, is something that we've been fighting uh, here in Kenya. We've had to take it to the End Corruption Commission and we are also trying to see how we can have it in parliament as well. We had a lot of petitions, and, and this is a clear example of, of how BAT has been interfering, and this they were caught flat-footed. As we are talking now, we are having a case in court where BAT uh, has stopped uh, the implementation of the tobacco control regulations. These regulations uh, 2014 were coming to effect on the 6th of June last year. But in April, uh, they went to court and they managed a stay. Uh, in, uh, they, they, they went to court suing uh, the Minister for Health for coming up with these regulations. These are the regulations which are to bring about uh, things like pictorial uh, warnings, the graphic health warnings, and, and to you know uh, put some uh, solatium or some levy uh, which would be used to uh, try and manage some of the health effects that are brought about by tobacco use. So they managed to stop this and we were in court for a long time until March this year when we, we, we won because the CIN was also joined as, a, as an interested party in this case. And then we won the case. And, and then the, the regulations were to take effect six months later. That was this September the 26th. Again, three days before the regulations took effect, they went to court again, and now they're in the Court of Appeal, and they're appealing the decision uh, of the High Court, which gave us uh, the, the, the victory that the, implement, the, the implementation of the regulation should go ahead. So again, they managed to get another stay of an, uh, another 30 days. So you, you, you can imagine that these are regulations which were supposed to take effect on the uh, 5th of June last year, and until now, more than one year later, 15 months later, they are still dragging us in court when they know very well that uh, we, 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 we are winning this case. So, so this is a, a critical case of the kind of delay that is there. The intimidation of BAT to the Kenyan government does not start now. It has been there before. Uh, we remember in COP5 in, in, in Seoul, Korea, they managed to follow up the government, the delegation of Kenya, and, and, and you know, even sent letters while the delegation was at the COP. They sent letters to the Minister of Foreign Affairs claiming that the position that uh, the Kenya government was uh, uh, presenting at the COP was not the position that uh, was was uh, was agreed, and and this this is this is actually uh, not true, and we managed to try and you know stop this and support the Kenya delegation at the COP. We have to watch out as we go to to, to India. Uh, some of the things that they are already starting to do is that they are trying to manipulate the positions that the countries are developing. They are trying to influence those positions uh, so that those positions to to the COP are weak. Those positions to the COP are influenced, and if they manage to do that, then they, 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 they feel very good about that. If they do not, then they still even follow up. They sponsor part of the government delegation or some of the delegations to COP, or they even sneak in and are part of those delegations, either as uh, you know experts or as uh, you know uh, officials, consultants, or whatever titles that they use. So we have to watch out on this and make sure that this one does not continue. The issue about uh, the increase also of the BAT budget, in April this year, BAT had uh, their annual general meeting in, 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 uh, in the UK. And, and one of the things that astonished us, we had a mock AGM also here in Kenya, and one of the things that astonished us is that they managed to sneak in uh, to have a budget of 100,000 uh, sterling pounds for BAT and its subsidiaries uh, of what is called uh, donations, political donations. This is very, very scary, knowing that uh, having such a budget is like legitimizing uh, bribery, legitimizing corruption, and, and this is money that is not well, uh, it's, it doesn't say properly what this money is going to do. So it's, it's, it's money that they are looking ahead to using for countries which have elections coming ahead, like 
Kenya having elections next year, then they are able to, you know, buy off politicians, try to have politicians to block uh, legislation and this course of things. So I just wanted to share those examples and, and, and warn us that we have to be very, very careful in terms of the preparation of the country positions. We have to be very, very careful also in uh, the delegations and uh, where the money comes, who is paying for who is sponsoring who, and we have to make sure that those people present themselves also as consultants or as uh, experts. Some of them are actually moles of, 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 of the tobacco industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, that was Samuel Ochiyang, Chief Executive Officer of Consumer Information Network in Kenya, and who is also among the leadership of Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals, or NATS. Well, current concerns have been raised. So shocking to hear the insidious and outrageous strategies tobacco industry uses to grow its markets. Saving lives is so important. We have amongst us NAT leader, Claude Franco, who is a senior international organizer of Challenge Big Tobacco campaign at Corporate Accountability International. It's over to you, Claude. Great, thank you all very much. Um, I have a powerful to share if I have the ability to do so. Hi, Glo. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Great. Well, thank you all um, very much. I'm really honored to be here today. Um, and again, my, my name is Chloe Franco. I'm, I'm based out of the United States with Corporate Accountability International. We're one of the accredited observers to the WHO FCTC. Um, and we'll have a team in New Delhi next month. Um, and I'm excited to, to follow up on the presentations given by the um, earlier panelists um, by shedding a little bit of light on what tobacco industry interference looks like at the conferences of the parties themselves and the anticipated action by parties um, that we could see at this upcoming COP in India. Um, so Stella already gave a really great background on Article 5.3, so I think I'll jump over this pretty quickly. Um, but what's important to recognize is that Article 5.3 itself is, um, we refer to it as the backbone of the SDTC. It's the element of the treaty that um, enables tobacco industry interference to be rooted out of the process so that other policies can take place. And when we think about the conferences of the parties themselves, um, it's kind of the same concept that by um, ridding the conferences of the parties from tobacco industry representatives infiltrating the process, um, that's how we have the best opportunity to ensure that those that are in the room at the negotiations are able to advance the strongest policies to protect public health and save lives. So there are two primary ways um, that the tobacco industry has managed to um, infiltrate and therefore undermine the cops. Um, the first is through attending as members of party delegations, and the second through is, is through attending as members of the public. Right now there is no screening process for party delegations. And what that means is that if an industry representative um, manages to secure a, um, an invitation to be a part of a formal party delegation, um, then they are accepted as part of that delegation because there's no um, screening or vetting process currently carried out by the convention secretariat. Um, and this gives those representatives immense access to undermine the negotiations directly. Um, and then in regards to the public, as a result of the Secretariat's commitment to transparency, the Secretariat allows a set number of quote-unquote public representatives into, ne into the negotiations every year. Um, and this process, too, has no screening associated with it, and it operates on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, and for this reason, the industry has been able to consistently exploit the process. Um, over past years. 
And I want to take a quick moment to note that the Article 5.3 um, guidelines were developed to um, further support and provide um, guidance, for lack of a better word, to parties as they go about implementing Article 5.3, um, both in their countries but also at the international level. And in particular, the guidelines state that parties should not nominate any person employed by the tobacco industry or any entity working to further its interests to serve on delegations to meetings of the COP. Um, so again, the guidelines are very clear when it comes to the fact that the tobacco industry should not be present or participating um, in the COP negotiations themselves. So I'll talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about um, industry participation on delegations. Um, and despite the very um, clear line in the guidelines, um, industry representatives still find their way onto delegations with regularity. In fact, according to an analysis carried out um, by the Secretariat of the Convention, at least 11 parties have sent tobacco industry representatives to COPS. Um, many of them multiple times. Um, these representatives include uh, state tobacco monopolies, specialized tobacco agencies, um, tobacco associations, and additional organizations. Um, and this number is, is actually probably low because it only includes individuals whose ties to the industry can be clearly identified through their formal business titles. And it goes without saying, but this is a public health treaty. So delegations representing tobacco industry interests um, run counter to the public health intentions of the treaty. And this is why the guidelines um, set out to exclude them in the first place. And uh, further to what what Sam shared a moment ago, I'd like to shed a little bit of further light on another revelation that came as a result of the BAT bribery scandal. Um, as Sam mentioned, last year um, a whistleblower from British American Tobacco came forward and revealed a conspiracy of bribery um, in Central and East Africa by BAT. And the example that I want to bring forward is that BAT bribed SCTC delegates from Rwanda, Burundi, and Comoros in order to undermine tobacco control policy making. And most specifically, an SCTC representative from Burundi was specifically bribed to represent BAT's interests at one of the international SCTC negotiations. Um, so this goes to show that um, even if an, if an individual's title doesn't necessarily clarify that they're representing the tobacco industry, there um, could be additional um, tobacco industry interests present at the COPS themselves. And I'll take a moment to talk about tobacco industry infiltration of the public. Uh, so the FCTC has a commitment to transparency, as I mentioned, and for this reason it provides a limited number of public badges. Um, as I mentioned, there's, there's no vetting process for this, um, and they're given out on a first-come, first-served basis. And so to paint a picture of what this um, unfortunately looks like in practice, it means that every year tobacco industry representatives line up um, early in the morning at the COPS um, and ensure that they receive the vast majority of the badges intended for the public. And what this means is that tobacco industry representatives are able to roam freely throughout the COP space. Um, and through doing so, they have the opportunity to intimidate and manipulate delegates, um, to lobby delegates without revealing their true identities um, and their, their conflicts of interest with, with public health, and also to access confidential draft documents that are developed in side meetings during the process. A couple of quick examples to pull forward. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the illicit trade protocol, um, it's a protocol that was developed um, within the SCTC. And the tobacco industry has been found complicit in illicit trade multiple times um, over the past few decades. So it has made multiple efforts to undermine and infiltrate the protocol. And at the third round of negotiations toward the illicit trade protocol, in fact, a survey concluded that 23 out of the 28 people 
who were willing to identify themselves within the public gallery, which was overlooking the negotiation space, were employed directly by the tobacco industry. So these individuals represented British American Tobacco, Japan Tobacco International, Philip Morris International, and Imperial Tobacco, among others. And these are the names of all of the, um, what we refer to as Big Tobacco, the largest and most powerful transnational tobacco corporations. So as a result of this and further interference, parties have been forced to eject the public from the final negotiating rounds for the illicit trade protocol and from the last two COPs, so, so COP 5 and COP 6. Um, and they're um, unfortunately anticipated to do so again this year um, until we are able to advance a comprehensive policy to protect the policymaking space from tobacco industry interference. And I think notably for, for, this, for this webinar, since it's focused on media, it's important to note that right now the media and the public enter the COPs under the same badge. So what that means is that the industry's manipulation of this public badge has in recent years had the unintended consequences of removing the media entirely from negotiations. And so that's another really important reason why we need to um, advance a strong policy at this COP that can ensure that we are not um, excluding the media unnecessarily from the process. So I want to take a really quick step back um, to recognize how the industry is manipulating this issue in order to attempt to um, shame and attack the convention secretariat directly. Um, and Stella already touched um, um, really effectively on the tobacco industry interference in the form of front groups and other associations um, that are doing the, the bidding of the tobacco industry. One of the most notable um, examples of this, as she mentioned, is the International Tobacco Growers Association um, and other tobacco growing, um, other, other farming associations. Um, first of all, it's worth noting that, that ITCA includes all of the major tobacco um, international corporations on its list of supporter members that finance the organization. And this again includes PMI, BAT, um, JTI, Imperial, Alliance One, and Universal Leaf. And internal documents have revealed that it has been a front group of the tobacco industry since its conception back in 1984. Um, most recently, ITCA held its annual conference in New Delhi um, just last month and used this as an opportunity to um, put pressure on the Indian government to allow um, farmers to participate in the COP itself and to secure multiple media articles um, claiming that ITCA should have a, t a seat at the table at COP7. And you can see on the right side of the screen some examples of some of the headlines that they secured through that meeting. Um, and then Stella also touched on, um, um, and actually make sure you touched on this as well, the, the, the role of think tanks um, in harping on transparency and securing op-eds um, truly around the world in key countries um, in advance of the COP that I attempt to, again, shame the Secretariat for its lack of transparency that is um, truly a result of, of tobacco industry interference that has forced parties to take action to exclude the public. So finally, um, the good news is that there is a solution to all of this, um, and that solution is to bring the COPs in line with Article 5.3 through advancing a policy that ensures that tobacco industry representatives are not admitted into the COP um, itself. Um, and so parties will be addressing this issue um, at COP7 coming up next month. Um, and what, one of the things that we anticipate is for parties to consider a proposal to screen tobacco industry representatives um, in order to exclude them from delegations, from the public, and from the media. And another proposal is to actually um, separate the, the accreditation process for the public and the media um, so that genuine members of the media um, are, are able to have access to the COPs themselves. Um, so that they don't have to be watching from the sidelines in the way that they have been forced to in recent years. And that is all from me. And I'll be happy to take questions when we have a Q&A period.
That was our final panelist, NET leader, Claude Franco, who is a senior international organizer of Challenge Big Tobacco campaign at COP and Accountability International. You heard the panelists speak out loudly. Participants, please keep sending questions using chat functions or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Now, let's begin the question and answer session. It's now over to my colleague, Shoba Shukla, who will be moderating the Q&A session. It's now over to you, Shoba Ji. Thank you, Ashok. Again, many virtual hands raised. So I would like the participants to please ask the questions themselves. Would Aarti Dhar, former assistant editor of the Hindu, like to ask a question? Yes, Aarti, can you hear me? Is Aarti listening? Yes. Anybody who would like to ask the question, Ramesh Chan Chauhan of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi, ask your question, please. I have asked because when they register, uh, there are some details that they provide. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Can you all yeah, hear yeah. me? Can you hear me? Okay. Ramesh from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, yeah. Delhi, wants to know that is okay, but how does tobacco industry influence the journalists? Can my question be heard? Can the panelists hear me? This is Chloe Anshova. I wasn't quite able to catch. Could you could you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, he wants to know the industry is influencing the politicians, but is it not influencing the journalists as well? How do we address that? Any of the panelists can answer the question. This is Chloe. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak to this. And I think that the other panelists are probably well positioned to speak to it as well. So I'll be extremely brief. Um, Not invite. It's absolutely true that the, that the tobacco industry does influence journalists. And I think a key, a key part of that um, is, of course, um, educating journalists to have an understanding of the FCTC and Article 5.3 to ensure that they recognize the conflict of interest if, for instance, they, um, they are asked to, to publish something coming from the tobacco industry. Um, and then I think um, it's wonderful, for instance, in the way that, that, that Maitri came forward and was able to share directly um, the, um, the request that she's received from the tobacco industry to publish their materials. Um, in terms of the, the COPs in particular, um, it's absolutely true that the tobacco industry does also attempt to infiltrate and undermine the COP and shape the messaging through influencing journalists directly. Um, and so similar to this webinar where there was a, a brief conflict of interest disclosure question, um, one of the proposals that parties will be considering at the COP this year is to ensure that um, representatives of the media as well 
are um, are asked to disclose any conflicts of interest and for what instance whether they've ever received um, funding from the tobacco industry to do their reporting before in order to ensure that that only um, genuine well-intentioned members of the media are um, that those are the individuals that are reporting on the cop as well and again I'm sure other panelists um, have something they'd like to add as well just to add on what Claude said, I think basically at the national level you find at times it's very, very difficult to get tobacco control stories across the media or at least some of the media. And this is because uh, some of the tobacco industry uh, companies, uh, BAT and others, some of them work very, very closely with the editors and, and try to you know, make sure that those, some of those stories do not see the light of day. At the COP level, of course, uh, we have maybe they pay for the, 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 some of the journalists to get there, some of the media personnel, I'm not saying all of them, but that's why we need the screening. And and we find that they are very much informed, the tobacco industry is very, very much informed in terms of what's happening. Uh, they, these guys keep tweeting them, keep informing them, keep updating them, and, and then they're able even to, you know, uh, strategize even when they're not at the courts. So this, these are entry points that they use the journalists to try and influence uh, to pay for the trips and to pay for, you know, luxurious like uh, trips abroad and all that. And then this is something that we need to really monitor so that it doesn't infiltrate the, the cops as well. Thank you. Uh, Arti, would you like to ask your question? Arti Dhar? Can you hear me? Ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yes, Arti, we can hear you. Hello? 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 Ha, hello, yes, we can hear you. Please ask your... Yes, hello? Yeah, uh, Please I want to know question. what... Yeah, what can be done to prevent interference by the tobacco industry? Do we need to amend FCTC or uh, what do you think can be done? Hello? Would you like to answer? Hello? Stella, would you like to answer a question? Stella, please unmute yourself. Or if you would like to answer. Aarti Dhar is from India. Chloe or Stella, would you like to answer Aarti's question? Hello, yes. Aarti uh, wants to know what can change, change yes. Great, Stella, are you there? I'm, I'm happy to let you go ahead. No, I, I don't. You heard I don't think Stella, so I'm happy to happy to answer quickly. Um, that's a great yes. question. I yes, think, please. I think a really big um, and important point is to. Um, continue to ensure that, for instance, as um, as journalists and representatives of the media, um, that that you're thinking critically about um, the way that um, the yes. tobacco industry is messaging and framing issues, yes. and ensuring that you're exposing um, the the ways that the industry um, uh, slants and, and bends the truth, and the need to, for instance, strengthen or, or change the, the the text of the treaty itself. Um, I'm really happy to say that the text of the treaty is extremely strong. Um, the guidelines that were developed for implementing Article 5.3 um, are, are as, uh, about as strong as it could get. And so the important thing is to ensure that we are promoting Article 5.3 and that we are advancing it, for instance, um, at the national level through advancing um, comprehensive tobacco control laws that implement the treaty 
um, in Article 5.3, specifically at the national level. And we are still um, trying to and then also that more detail how many people we have registered to date. And it, it seems that we can only guess one thing, one thing at a time. If we ask three things, we get one response. So we go back and ask two more things, and we get one response. It just seems to be the way it's working this, with this meeting. So, so we are trying to, to, to get a little more detail. Uh, in terms of how many, uh, we are having our our own project with DMS, uh, and the project meeting is going to be the day before. So most of these people are coming, and they're mostly mostly uh, oncology nurses. So they might be more interested in. Uh, oh, they actually a lot of them are interested. In so I think we'll be a mix of where they're going to go. So um, we I recruited ten. Um, I believe Stella had actually given us the heads up that she had to take another call at some point during the <laughs> what's, what's happening right now. Apologies. Um, yeah. But I, I think the important thing to note is that the, the treaty is, is really strong. And so what we can be doing is ensuring that it's being implemented at both the, the national level and the international level. Uh, thank you. Uh, are the uh, how yeah, can journalists are, attend the seventh for talk to during the morning coming to this free workshop? Um, and again, it's going to be a minute because it's really relevant to what's going on. So our partners and champions really work across the whole range from in the clinical side. Uh, one of our nurses is in charge of the cancer registry, so very much interest in, in research. Uh, we have a nurse really interesting policy. She already testified in the Senate, so she's really interested. So I think it's going to, I think it's at least, and I'm hoping that going forward, others will come and register. And I know that there are, um, last, well, the one time we got an answer we had, and this was about a month and a half ago, I think we had about eight to ten people register. So that's not counting my ten. So I think we'll, we'll get, we'll get a, a, a share good, a fair good number. Okay, we have Joseph Megero from Kenya who wants to know that tobacco advocates do to create more awareness, especially in Africa, to protect FCTC from industry interference. This is a question from Joseph Megero from Kenya. Samuel, would you like to? Samuel, I are you there? Yes, I'm here, but I didn't get you while you're breaking. Okay. Joseph Maguero saying what? Oh, okay, okay. He's saying that as tobacco advocates do to create more awareness, especially in Africa, to protect FCC. Okay, he's, he's, he's breaking. But uh, what, what I get is that he's asking uh, how. Uh, Tobacco control advocates to create more awareness in Africa about FCTC. Yes. Yeah, I think basically that is something that we we need to do. I know there are a number of organizations now, and in Kenya we have quite a number of organizations also working around issues of tobacco control. And we need the support of the media. I know we are using the social media very much as well. But I do agree with him that. Uh, Issues of FCTC and particularly Article 5.3, we need to escalate the awareness, and and, and, and that yeah, is really really I critical think, uh, in terms of uh, you know making the like very like 27th or something like that because of give and take. So that's about three and a half weeks from now or so, because that will give us time to look at everybody's and if we need to make some changes to avoid too much overlap, we still would have time to do that as well. Anybody else who would like to ask a question themselves from the participants? Anybody would like to ask a question from the participants? 
Govind Kumar Tripathi from the Southeast Asia Office of the Union, the International Union Against He wants to know, you see the role of media and civil society as pressure groups involved to, to frame and adopt strict guidelines under Article 5.3. Government has ratified FCTC, but at the same time has 30% share in ITC company. Would somebody like to answer that? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Maitri wants to answer a question, ask a question. Maitri, would you like to ask a question? Hello. Yes, yes, please ask me. Yeah, I, I, would, I, don't know, I would like to take uh, Govin's question. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you, Matri. Please proceed. Yeah, so uh, okay, Hello. can you please repeat Govind's question? He said, what do you see? How do you see the role of media and civil society as pressure group uh, no. to uh, okay, frame, so, uh, adopt, and uh, strict guidelines under Article 5? Right. Uh, he also mentioned that ITC has 30%, uh, Indian government has 30% uh, stake in the ITC. Yeah, the Indian Indian tobacco company has been uh, long creating menace in, uh, uh, you know, sort of influencing the government policies. Uh, it is also, uh, uh, I mean, media is a uh, media is a pressure group. However, Indian tobacco company sometimes does ensure that any sort of stories which are not in its favor are therefore not published in media, as rightly pointed out by Samuel. Uh, Indian Tobacco Company also engages in surrogate advertising by holding uh, competitions and uh, contests in schools. Uh, and therefore, very recently, the CBSE Board of Schools had banned the Spellby competition, which was being held by ITC. We have a notification uh, issuing the uh, same ban. And uh, we had also printed the particular story where, uh, you know, the CBSE schools had banned any sort of... Uh, uh, contests or competitions which were organized by ITC as a corporate social responsibility initiative. Really, there is surrogate and advertising and therefore a conflict of interest. So, uh, yes, it is a tough war between uh, uh, the media, civil society, government, and private tobacco companies. Uh, they do time and again uh, in try to influence by sending out press releases. Uh, speaking for myself, uh, they have never quite approached me to uh, uh, kind of in their positive sense would be uh, you know they and such can can't understand that this is being a PR question please What? The hurt. 